I'm excited to get back to the Gospel of Matthew. Um, right before what we're getting ready to study, right after Jesus predicts his death for the third time, telling his disciples, two blonde men start shouting, Son of David. And Jesus responds and goes over, even though he knows to his death, he responds by healing them. This final uh, week begins, not today, but we're going to be looking at it for a while. It's called Holy Week. And it's really interesting because two-fifths of the Gospel of Matthew, three-fifths of the Gospel of Mark, a third of Luke, and half of John talk about this week, beginning with Jesus entering Jerusalem. There's 89 chapters in all the Gospels. Four chapters that are the first 30 years of Jesus' life, and then 55 chapters are the three and a half years of ministry, and then 29 of the chapters are about that whole Holy Week. Now I want you to imagine that you are in Jerusalem in Jesus' day. And it's one square mile in where you're going. The population is usually 6,000 people, but today there's 2.5 million people packed into this little space. And think about it. This is the third Passover since Jesus has started his ministry. At the same time that Jesus would be coming in, 256,000 lambs would be brought in to begin the selection process. Each lamb was going to be sacrificed for sin, and each lamb represents a family of about 10 people. We're going to get to this in a minute, but the lambs would have been chosen from the flocks in Bethlehem, and they're owned by the Sadducees. But imagine... The blood of 256,000 lambs. They would have to actually dig trenches and pour water mixed with the blood so it would flow. Does that remind you of anything? 2.5 million people in a square mile. Now think, all these people are, are going to need a place to stay while they're there. Think about how much food is going to be needed. I don't know if you've ever lived in a town that was near um, some kind of tourist place, but most of the uh, people that I knew growing up that lived on the beach, they would make almost all of their money in about a 10-week period of time because that's when everybody would be there. That would be kind of like this. Everybody would have been gearing up for this particular week because this was the one everybody was going to come to. This was the celebration of, of celebrations, the, forgive, the forgiveness of sins. Now imagine what people would have been thinking as they're coming in. Jesus has been around Jerusalem for over three years. He's been performing miracles. He's been teaching. Jesus was known, probably the most known person. So there would have been a buzz on this day, this Sunday morning, with all kinds of people talking. Now, we're going to get to the verses in a minute, but just think about people seeing Jesus and saying, I, I was there when he changed the water into wine. I saw him heal a leper. I was there when a man who couldn't walk, Jesus touched him, and he began to walk. Well, I was, I was listening to his disciples, and I saw his disciples get in a boat and leave. We wanted to hear more, so me and my friends went to where we thought Jesus was going to be. When we got to the other side, there was Jesus, but only one boat. I heard the disciples say he walked on water. One guy could have said, my cousin has always been blind. Jesus touched him, and he can see. 
My father followed Jesus into the wilderness to hear him teach. And he said, nobody brought food except one little boy. And Jesus prayed, and almost 20,000 of us were fed with this miracle bread. Well, God says, that's nothing. My mother went to be with Martha and Mary from Bethany when their brother died, Lazarus. He was in the tomb for four days. He was stinking dead. And Jesus spoke and Lazarus came out. Jesus must be the one, the son of David, the Messiah. We should make him the king. I heard he's coming now to be here for Passover. And it was also time. God picked the exact perfect time. This was going to be the day prophesied about 300 years before, 700 years before. This actual perfect day was going to be it. And the crowd is actually crying, save us, save us. That's what they're shouting. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So my question for us this morning is, who do we worship? Who do we worship? Who do you worship? And why? We're going to answer some of those questions. Who is he? What kind of power does Jesus have? And how does it change us? Now, this is best chronology, 32 AD. It's the first month. In the Jewish calendar, Nisan, and not the car, Nisan. Um, <laughs> and it's the arrival of the 10th, and the crucifixion is the 14th, and God has a very fixed timetable. It's the Passover week of that year, and Friday will be the day when all of those lambs are slain. None of which can really take away the sin, but on that same day, Good Friday. There will be one that makes a sacrifice for all. And he can take away the sins of the world. And, it, and he will be remembered for all of human history. Just like John the Baptist said. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So as they're approaching. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt beside her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Now, I think this is... Amazing because there's like a miracle going on. And, and we've seen so many miracles that Jesus did. We don't even realize we're reading one. He had just predicted his death for the third time. He had just healed some blind men. And now Jesus going up to Jerusalem. And on the way he took them aside. And he tells them exactly, exactly what's going to happen to him. From Thursday night to Friday all the way to Sunday morning. They will mock him and flog him and crucify him. Jesus knew ex the exact time they were going to crucify him. Jesus was not planning a coronation here. He was not planning to take the kingdom the way the people thought that he was. He was not planning to attack the Romans. He was not planning to overthrow the Gentile occupying army. The Israelites were thinking... That's what we should do. That's why they're saying Hosanna. That's why they're screaming, save us. Save us from who? The oppressors. There are things that they expected the Messiah to do. But our Messiah was coming to be killed by the leaders of Israel themselves and to die and to rise again. As a matter of fact, earlier... Jesus had told his disciples this, the son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We worship the one who died for our sins. This, I mean, this is amazing. At this moment, Jesus knows exactly where he's going and exactly at what time they're going to crucify him. And he still keeps doing miracles. Just think about it. 
the one who knows all things, knows what people are thinking. And we're so used to seeing Jesus do this. He sent two of his disciples and he said to them, go to the village ahead of you. Now, now remember, two and a half million people are all around. It's like busy in this little area. And you're going to find exactly where he told them there's going to be... The, nobody's getting it? Like, this is like amazing. Jesus knew where the cult was going to be. He knew what question the man that owns it is going to ask. And he knew what his disciples were going to have to say. Okay, I don't... <coughs> yeah, like, I know we've like... You know, 20,000 people fed, walk on water, I know that. But he's telling them, he's still doing miracles. How did he know that? (laughs) He knows where every donkey is. (laughs) Not just that one, all of them. (laughs) He expected somebody to, to say, what are you doing with my animal? The Lord needs it. Is that a good explanation? (laughs) There's people all over the place. These two guys come walking up. They start untying. Hey, guys, what are you doing? Oh, the Lord needs this. (laughs) He lets them go. Well, he knows. He knows where the animal is. He knows where the man is. And he knows how he'll respond. And he knows what the man will do. He's God in human flesh, right? And he'll send the donkey back. Okay, I'm sure. I just think that's awesome. He is still doing miracles and he's fulfilling exactly the prophecies that were prophesied about this day. We worship the one who obeys the word of God perfectly. As a matter of fact, in John it says, he is the word. And that word was made flesh. Remember all of the times that Jesus slipped away? Like they were coming to get him and he slipped away and he slipped away. They went to a different area. He's going in on purpose now. Hosanna literally means save I pray. Lord save I pray. It draws us to Psalms 118. Lord please grant us success. He who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed. From the house of the Lord we bless you. Passover is celebrating the rescuing of the people of God from the Egyptians. And in Numbers 6 it says, May Yahweh bless you and protect you. May Yahweh make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May what Yahweh look with you fair favor and give you his peace. In this way, they will pronounce my name all over Israel and I will bless them. The one who is blessed... Or is the blesser is the one that comes in the name of the Lord. He is the one who bringing the coming of the kingdom of David. So 2 Samuel, you can write these down. This is, you can go back and read these. 2 Samuel chapter 7, 12 through 16, being fulfilled right then. Isaiah 9, 1 through 7, being fulfilled right then. Isaiah 11, 1 through 10, being fulfilled right then. Jeremiah 23, 5 through 8 is being fulfilled. Ezekiel 32 23 and 24 is being fulfilled. Micah 5, 2 through 4 is being fulfilled. But the prophecies are being fulfilled not in the way that the people were thinking. They were thinking as Jesus coming in, he's he's here. We've seen all, all that he could do. We've heard him teach. Everybody's here now. Two point five. All of us are here. Could they have probably taken the city back? Yeah, yeah, they could. I mean, everybody's there. That's why they don't want the revolt happening then. That's why they were trying to do everything secretively. Because if they pulled him out and they were going to crucify him on that day, they would have probably all died. But Jesus wasn't coming like they thought. They were thinking, he's going to ride in here, he's going to rally the troops together, and we're going to take back over and we'll be free. He is going to do that. But in a different way. He is the king. 
But he's not just here for this one time in history. He is here for all time. They're looking for something temporal, political, military. When Zechariah was talking about the great Messiah to come, he says, Rejoice greatly, O Zion. Shout, O Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. Huh. So Jesus, in a way, is kind of saying, I'm the king, but I'm not the king that fits into your way of thinking. I bring together majesty and meekness, power and weakness. I bring salvation, but not like your thinking. This is a very strange way to begin this week. There are so many chapters. This is chapter 21. We're going to go all the way to chapter 28. Between now and Easter, so I hope I could get all that in. We'll see. It'd be... <laughs> So it's a bizarre event that's happening now. Nobody knows what's happening. There's nothing that they're thinking. It's almost like they're trying to make a coronation for Jesus. There's really no question. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the promised king. He is the son of David. He's the one who has the right to reign. His lineage, check it out. His mother and father born in the line of David. All his qualifications. He's the son of man. He's the son of God. He has demonstrated his deity and his full humanity throughout his whole ministry. His compassion and love for people. All the times that Jesus gets interrupted but he stops and he heals or he listens. That's why this is such a strange event. That's why it's not a true expression of faith. But because they don't have faith in, they got the wrong thing. It's not a true expression of praise because they don't have real faith. It's just going to be a few days when they're going to be saying, crucify him. From Hosanna, save us, to crucify him. And the whole time Jesus is thinking, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How I long to gather you. I, I can't imagine the, the compassion that he keeps having. And, and why? Well, let's, let's read some more. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road. While others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him. And those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest They would have palm branches on their money when they were free people. Okay. The Jewish people would have palm branches on their money when they were free. And they were now taking palm branches and laying them before Jesus. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And then guess what he does? Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said, my house. Do you see what? My house will be. Call it a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Now, why are they robbing? Well, we're going to see in a minute. What kind of power is Jesus? Jesus enters Jerusalem, and he comes right to the temple, and he looked around. What's he doing? He's casing the place. He's walking around looking. He's planning his strategy for the next day, right? He entered the temple. And he began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple. Overturning the tables, the seats, selling doves. He would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to say, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. Listen to what the chief priest, head of this, began seeking how to destroy him. For they were afraid. The whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. What is Jesus doing? They they got a huge problem now. 
He is forcing them to make a decision now. And he hasn't done this throughout the whole ministry. He attacked them at the very heart of the massive crowd that was stirred up. This is all God's design. Every point of it all the way to Friday when we know what's going to happen. Jesus knowing that there's only a few days left. All of the gospel writers record this event, Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And all the gospel writers record the event of him clearing the temple. This is the second time he's cleared the temple. Three years earlier he did the same thing. Jesus has come into Jerusalem as the king. Matthew Henry says this, this was the only act of regal authority and coercive power that Christ did in the days of his flesh. This is real godly anger. It's not directed, as many would like, at the Romans, but instead, Jesus goes to the temple and he shows his divine authority over the temple. This is how corrupt the system had gotten this is how corrupt it had gotten. According to Levitical law, you were supposed to bring a lamb without defect. To guess who? To the priest. They would examine the animal, approve or disapprove, and then... But listen to what they had going. This is this business enterprise. This place in Jesus' day in the temple courts was called the Bazaar of Annas. Annas was the corrupt high priest. And who saw a great money-making thing. It's like the chief priest owned the concession stands at the Eagles games. Because that's, that's what the hike is on this, right? You, you brought a lamb with you, but it doesn't pass. So they have to go to the outer courts. And according to the Jewish historian, um, Alfred Erdstein, a person would often have to pay as much as Ten times what normally would cost. So you would bring your lamb and they would examine and say, no, it's not good enough. But you can go over here and pick. <laughs> and we'll give you a fraction of the cost for this one. My guess is they probably just started selling them again too because they were probably the best people could bring. And you couldn't use any foreign money. So you couldn't use any of the money that was all around Galilee area. It had to be Hebrew coinage. This is what the historian said. From Jerusalem. So you have to go to a different concession stand and exchange your money to go and get to buy the lamb that they approve of. Has anybody ever changed money? It's like stressful. I've been to quite a few countries and every time I'm like, okay, I'm reading, I'm like watching on the, I mean, it's stressful. You want to make sure you're, and it's really hard to spend. When I was in Spain, it was like, you know what, I'm just going to treat these as dollars. It was only $2 to eat lunch. Like, you, I don't know how you're supposed to do it, but they're exchanging and they're ripping people off. And what did God tell his people to never do? You never charge my people interest. This was a shakedown. As a matter of fact, the historian said this. It, it was called a service charge. 25%. I remember listening to this. Um, when I worked at the uh, newspaper, there was this friend of mine, and I'd never heard this terminology before. He used to bet on a lot of uh, sports games. And it was, what was he, did he call it? He called it the VIG. And I was like, what is that? I mean, I was really young, and I'd never even heard all the terms that he was using. Basically, he had borrowed money from somebody to place bets, and it was something like $10,000. And he had to pay $2,000 a week, a week, and the $10,000. He didn't even make that much money. Do you, do you understand how, that kind of interest? Like, they're making a ton of money because this guy, until he can pay the 10, he has to keep giving 2000 every week. That's exactly what these evil priests are doing to the poor people. So you go to another concession stand. <laughs> can you even imagine? 
It's a giant mafia-run casino thing. That's why Jesus is so mad. He comes in there, everything is wrong about what's happening. It's supposed to be you picked one out from your flock. You brought it in. It's one that you loved, one that you took care of. It was the best you have. That's what you're supposed to be bringing. And what are they doing? They're saying, no, yours isn't good enough. You have to buy one of these. God's people, God's temple, and Jesus confronts it all right here. One commentator said this. They were about to meet someone over whom they had absolutely no power. Without warning and without resistance, Jesus cast out both the merchants and their customers and overturned the tables of the money changers before thousands and thousands of worshipers. Now, they would have been in shock. And the priest who happened to be present, Jesus made a shamble of the bazaar and declared the, the shame of, of all those who profited from it. So he said the whole arena must have been in confusion. Just think about it. Doves flying all over the place, money rolling down, people trying to jump on some of the money. You can imagine, right? It's just chaos. Now why did nobody try to stop Jesus? Maybe they knew they were doing the wrong thing. Maybe they were actually scared. Hmm. Maybe they were scared of all the people. Because when Jesus confronts them and he tells them what they're doing, they're thinking all the people now are going to be like, yeah, he's right. You've been ripping us off for years. Jesus came that we studied in humiliation. There was no room in the end. He came born and put in a feeding trough. Who was pregnant before she got married. And he would die a shameful death on a Roman cross. Forsaken by everyone. Even his own father. But for now. In this moment Jesus is in control. And the shameful acts of these Jewish leaders are being exposed. He's actually quoting from Isaiah. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Then as the shock wore off. Jesus changes gears. Who is he? What kind of power does Jesus have? Now, how, how does this change us? Look, he's just done all this. Let me read this verse. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. In the midst of all that, some, some are like, well, I'm, I'm going to try. <laughs> and he healed them. Like, in all that, Jesus still had compassion. He was loving. What if we are so radically loved because of what Jesus has done, in spite of all our sinfulness, our flaws, what if our relationship to God is completely dependent not on our record, but on Jesus' record? Not on our past, but Jesus' past. Not on our performance, but the performance of Jesus. Not on our life, but Jesus' life. As Martin Luther said, Christians are simultaneously righteous in the sight of God, loved and delighted in by God, and yet absolutely flawed and sinful to the degree, broken in themselves. We should be humbled by the gospel. That we were so sinful that Jesus had to die for us. But at the same time, we should be emboldened by the gospel because we were so valuable that Jesus was glad to die for us. When Jesus goes to the house and he says, this is my house, he's being bold and he's forcing everybody out. Here's what he's doing. You either have to right now, and he hasn't done this all the other times that they were going to try to make him king, he slipped away. But this moment, he's coming in, and you got to do one of two things. You can't be lukewarm. You can't be tepid. You either have to be cold or you have to be hot. You either have to go in and go, 
you're my king. You're the Messiah. You're the Savior. Whatever you want, I'm here, Jesus. Or you have to kill him. He's not letting there be any middle. He's actually forcing all of us as we read this to go, what are you going to do? Who are you going to worship? Is it going to be me? Or are you going to be the one that puts me on the cross? Because at the end of the week, the crowd's not yelling, Hosanna, save us. They were yelling, crucify him. They weren't yelling, save us. But Jesus was. You don't understand, I am saving you. This is necessary. Even from the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. As he was taking our punishment, our hell, he said, I thirst. He said, it is finished. How does God want us to respond to this amazing love? And we're going to be studying all about from this moment all the way up until the resurrection God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. After all this had happened, Jesus was still reaching out and opening blind eyes. Are your eyes open? Who do you worship? Let's pray. Father, we come to you. And we thank you. For your love, we thank you for your mercy, we thank you for your kindness, we thank you for your boldness here, and we ask that you would help us. If, I, if, if I'm blind in any way, open my eyes, Lord, let me see, let me see. How can I praise you? Lord, if there's anyone in here that before Jesus enters Jerusalem, he heals the blind men. At the end of this, he's still healing blind. Open our eyes. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. We will shout Hosanna because you are willing to save us. Amen.